instead of planning an elaborate escape, you planned a murder. Tonight on 2020, the gripping story that you become a national obsession. It's just chaos. It set off a roller coaster story. Jesse Blanchard, an inspirational young girl who grabbed the hearts of millions. <laughs> Celebrities like Blake Shelton, Miranda Lambert, Elijah Wood, rallying around the princess in a wheelchair. Happy endings are not just in fairy tales. You're the reason I was born to be your mom. Completely dependent on her doting mother, who suddenly found murder. We found Dee Blanchard deceased of a violent nature. What happened with your mom that night? I don't Tonight, the twist no one saw coming. The girl looked 12, sounded 5, and had a 40-year-old attitude. How can this young, sick girl who can't walk be involved in her mother's death? We're taking you inside prison to see the stunning transformation in her only network interview. How did you go from this to this? Plus, the mystery man who came between mother and daughter speaking out for the first time hi honey now one of the most elaborate con games ever how was Dee, Dee able to get away with this for so long he wants to get out <laughs> ain't gonna happen i'm elizabeth vargas and i'm david mueller and this is 2020 here's amy robot <laughs> <Sorry, Dawn. laughs> All movies capture the vibrant spirit of a young teenage girl. So where are you going today? I'm going to Children's Mercy Hospital to see my dentist. Or my teeth. Full of enthusiasm and effervescence, but behind the smiles, life for Gypsy Blanchard and her mother Dee Dee is one replete with hardships and challenges. Gypsy is in a wheelchair. They were local darlings. I mean, they were the shining star in this town of people who can outlast adversity and get through everything. The mother-daughter duo are local celebrities, the subject of countless local news profiles and articles. Gypsy and her multiple illnesses and diseases, leukemia, muscular dystrophy. She had learning disabilities, had not been able to be out of a wheelchair since she was five years old. And so the community really embraced them. Dee Dee's originally from Louisiana, a one-time beauty queen. We are a military queen. And nurses aid. She marries Rod Blanchard at age 24. Together, the couple welcomes a beautiful baby girl. Perfectly healthy, pretty little baby. Named their Gypsy Rose. I was excited and very scared. I'm not gonna lie, I was scared. I'm 18 years old and I, I got a baby here, so. Uh... But she was beautiful and perfectly yeah, healthy. Yeah, she was. Nothing wrong with her. She looked perfect. Hey, you. You wanna blow me a kiss? Very good. But the relationship was far from perfect, and the couple broke up. Not long after, Didi was saying that she was sick, problems, sleeping, epilepsy, and it just progressed from there. Leukemia, paralyzed muscular dystrophy, and she would have seizures. Gypsy was probably seven, eight years old. She's in a wheelchair now. She needs a feeding tube. Was Didi a good mother? I told Didi she was the best mother. There's no way I can do what you're doing. You have a sick child, you, it's constantly 24-7 taking care of her and everything. I mean, I always praised her and told her, good job. Rod and his new wife, Christy, would have sporadic visits with Gypsy, but they are never alone. You know, all the visits, Dee Dee had to be there the whole time. Something never felt right about it. Just, Dee Dee was so controlling of her. This is the last photo taken of Rod with his daughter before fate would seemingly deal Gypsy and Dee Dee another cruel blow leaving the pair displaced and depleted by Hurricane Katrina in 2005. In some areas, the water is now 20 feet deep. Their home ravaged by the storm and floodwaters. They took refuge at this nearby special needs shelter. I've learned from Dee Dee was that they were homeless, no place to go. So the Mercy Hospital loaded them up on the helicopter and came up. They were evacuated here to Springfield, Missouri, birthplace of Route 66, a tight-knit community in the buckle of the Bible Belt. 
With Didi, a full-time caregiver, they're forced to piece together a life, largely from donations, disability payments, and child support from Gypsy's dad. A turning point seems to be when the family gets this home, located at the aptly named intersection of Hope Road and Volunteer Way. I remember my mom had gave me this little glass house, and she said, this one day this will be real. And now it finally is. The Blanchards moved into that house, built by Habitat for Humanity. A wheelchair ramp was built just for her. She was like one of the happiest people I had ever met, and yet she was the most sick that I had ever met at the same time. In between hospital stays, Gypsy frequently jet sets across the country. Ball games, galas, the most magical place on earth, Disney World. Make-A-Wish for taking her down to Orlando, all expenses paid and everything. Right now, I'm in Cinderella Castle, getting some royal She even got to meet country superstars Miranda Lambert and then-husband Blake Shelton. Miranda Lambert yes. came to Springfield a few times, and I think she gave Dee Dee and Gypsy money. Yes, she did. Look at this $3,500 check from the singer's personal account. But that wasn't all. What must I do? Check her out posing with her favorite actors, Elijah Wood and Sean Astin from Lord of the Rings. No, Come on, Frodo! <laughs> sounds like a really awesome life but i mean it's not worth like what condition her health was in but in private gypsy just wants to be a regular teen and find love according to friend and neighbor Aaliyah woodmansey she would show interest in like different boys and try to ask me advice on like you know how how do you approach them how do you like kiss a boy Aaliyah says mom Dee, Dee didn't approve of the girl talk and it was like my daughter has the mentality of a child like you're talking to her about teenage girl things but gypsy ignores her mother going behind her back and sets up this online dating profile she soon connects with this man and pours out her soul i need to tell you something i'm no model i have a medical condition so i can't walk I have a chair I use. Is that an issue? Why would that be a problem? You are an angel in my eyes. It will never make any difference in how I see you from the inside out. And with a few strokes of the keyboard, a secret online relationship blooms. But when we come back, ain't gonna happen. Mother and daughter are nowhere to be found. Oh my gosh, somebody has kidnapped Gypsy. The little pink house becomes a crime scene. Things are not always as they appear. Next. citizens, Gypsy Blanchard and her mother, Dee Dee, taking center stage. At a Relay for Life event to raise money for the American Cancer Society. You're the reason I was born to be your mom. But the sickly and often secluded Gypsy believes she too has found her guardian angel, not at home in her mother, but online with a man. Nick go to John. She was in love with him. She thought that he was going to be the prince that came and finally saved her and got her out of her locked tower, and they'd live happily ever after. Look at some of the messages the love-struck teenager sends a friend about her Prince Charming. I met a wonderful guy. He's my first boyfriend. He gives me poems and is so romantic. She was talking about this new guy that she was now in love with and that they had met on a Christian dating site and that they were already planning on naming their children after him. We want a snow wedding in a gazebo with red and white roses. Honestly, what I was thinking whenever I saw these messages is that these were just like fantasies and dreams. But on their shared Facebook page, the harsh reality is what people saw. Dee Dee presented as a very doting mother. This was her child, she knew she was sick, and she was just going to love her unconditionally until she couldn't anymore. But then comes the day when family friends Kim and David are horrified when something very different popped up on Gypsy and Dee Dee's Facebook page, a very vulgar post. It said the bitch is dead. I instantly took it as their Facebook account had gotten hacked. Then we saw the second one, which said, and I raped her sweet daughter too.
Jim and David race to the little pink house, no one seems to be home, but their new car is in the driveway. We circle the house, knocked on all the doors and windows. I called the police and let them know that we needed a wellness check done on a disabled mother and daughter. And they said that they would send somebody out. We have breaking news. The body of 48-year-old Claudania Blanchard has been found. Gypsy is still missing this morning. And a huge police presence. The crime tape was up around the house. And you just can't forget that pink house with the wheelchair ramp. I see a stretcher come out of the house and there's a sheet over a body and I just start sobbing. I thought was Dee Dee. We found Dee Dee Blanchard, uh, deceased and uh, of a violent nature. Uh, we were still actively looking for Gypsy. Then we really panicked because, oh my gosh, somebody has kidnapped Gypsy. Tell me about the moment when you heard that something happened to Dee Dee and that Gypsy was missing. Uh, you know, I was shocked. I was like, what? Really? Couldn't understand it. Why would somebody do this to this child? You know, no wheelchair, no medication. They're going to just leave her for dead. Authorities move quickly and hit pay dirt when they trace the IP address of those profane Facebook posts to a small house 600 miles away in Big Bend, Wisconsin, at the home of Nick Godajon, Gypsy's boyfriend. Who is Nick Godajon? He functions at about a 15 or 16 year old. He is a kid that sort of is similar to Gypsy from the standpoint of not really having a normal social interaction history that most kids would have had up to that point. They go to the house. There's some sort of standoff for a period of time. They have to bring a SWAT team there. When authorities enter the home, they take both into custody. We started hearing from various sources that Gypsy wasn't a victim. She wasn't kidnapped that she was actually involved in this somehow. It was beyond shocking. We have located uh, Gypsy in another state. Uh, she is okay. Uh, we do have another person of interest in custody. I'm Detective Hancock from the County Sheriff's Office. Um, and your mom's dead. Yes, she's deceased, all right? Now, what I want to ask you, did you have involvement in this? No. Hang on, hang on, hang on listen to me. What happened with your mom that night? <laughs> Gypsy keeps mom in the interrogation room. What does the other one say? Apparently, from what she told me, her mom kicked her out of her house. Okay. What happens next leaves everyone in Springfield stunned. Go back to the newsroom and it's, it's just chaos. Okay, this story has completely done a 180. I bet my mouth was... And what a transformation you'll hear from Gypsy herself next. where Claudinia Blanchard was found stabbed to death and set off a roller coaster story. What would drive Gypsy to want to plan the murder of her own mother? Local teenage hero Gypsy Rose Blanchard could be the most unlikely murder suspect ever. A supposed paraplegic suffering from muscular dystrophy, epilepsy, leukemia, and confined to a wheelchair is now under arrest. Both she and her boyfriend Nick charged with killing her mother. People were saying, well, maybe she was tricked into doing this. She met somebody online. He wanted to take her away, and the mother wouldn't let her. They fought. Somehow the mother was killed. It was still the prevailing thought that she was really innocent. The princess outfit's now replaced with an orange jumpsuit. My vision was still of this fragile little girl, and that was, that was shattered. It was hard to wrap your brain around how can this young, sick girl who can't walk be involved in her mother's death? So it was shocking beyond shocking. Things are not always as they appear. The people of Springfield might think they are witnessing a miracle when astonishingly... It was Gansom versus Gypsy Blanchard. Check out Gypsy's first appearance in court. Yes, that's her walking. No wheelchair, no signs of distress, not even a limp. Gypsy crying through the proceedings and shocking many of those who knew her because she was walking and not using a wheelchair. I still did not want to believe that she could walk when 
they showed her on the news. In fact, I rewound it and played it multiple times because that's not who we knew. Just when you thought the Dee Dee Blanchard murder case could not get any stranger, we've covered stories where you find out that someone you thought was so sweet and innocent and turns out there's a different side, but it was like a prize fight where it's just one hit after the other. And I was happy she was walking. Big red flags, I felt so stupid. If she can walk, what else have we been lied to about? Later in this hour, we will show you the astounding extent of those lies. But one thing that is real, her voice. That voice is something you don't forget. 2103 West Volunteer Way, Springfield, Missouri. There were comparisons to cartoon characters, saying that she was forcefully talking like a baby. It sounded a little like maybe she had had some helium. Take a listen as Gypsy calls her father from jail. Daddy, I understand that we haven't had a chance to get close in a long time coming my whole life. I have a lot of questions, obviously, you know, I'm confused. The stuff you see in the news is horrible and not true. You know that I love my mama and you know that I would never hurt her. At her arraignment, Gypsy enters a plea of not guilty to her mother's murder. We are here in Missouri. We're driving to visit Gypsy Rose in prison. The big question, is she a murderer or is she a victim? When she walks into the meeting room, I'm immediately struck by her radically changed appearance. She has long, curly hair, makeup, and her once frail frame has filled out. She tells me about the genesis of that relationship with Nick Godijan, meeting him online and quickly falling in love, even hatching an ill-fated plan to introduce him to overprotective Dee Dee at a screening of Cinderella. How did it go? Awful. Oh my God. She got jealous because I was spending a little too much attention on him. And she had ordered me to stay away from him. And Needless to say, that was a very long argument that lasted a couple weeks. An argument that lasted a couple of weeks, what does that look like? Yelling, throwing things, calling me names, bitch, slut, whore. Did you hate your mother at that point? I didn't hate her. You wanted her dead. Yes, but it was not because I hated her. It was because I wanted to escape her. Gypsy says while Dee Dee took her to the hospital to have her feeding tube replaced, seen here, the last known image of Dee Dee alive. Nick traveled to Springfield from Wisconsin. That's him checking into a local Days Inn motel where he waited for Gypsy to give word Dee Dee is asleep. The is gonna go down tonight. Just the gloves and knife? Duct tape too, to muffle her. I'll pre-cut it. How are you feeling? Honestly terrified but then i had taken some medication that was not prescribed to me to calm me down gypsy says she hands the items to nick and hides in the bathroom while he goes into the bedroom matching nick's story to police okay i'll admit it i did actually stab her i will admit it so when you're stabbing me where is she at She's on her stomach. Did she scream or holler? Or... Yeah, she did. What was she saying? First she said, hello. And then what did she say? And then she called up for Gypsy, but she didn't do anything. I heard her scream once, and there was more screaming, but not like the kind in a horror film, just like a startled scream. And she called out to my name about three or four times. And at that point, Incredibly, the couple says they have sex on Gypsy's bed, Dee Dee's body in the room next door, before taking a cab back to Nick's motel. And there they are, caught on surveillance cameras. It's disconcerting to see how quickly they were able to turn off 
any kind of impact from the murder, it seemed there was no effect on them. Hi, mommy. <laughs> Gypsy then shoots video of them in the hotel room. He's naked in bed. Hey, brownie. And this is just hours after Gypsy heard her mother screaming for her help and Nicholas killed her. It's like they shut a door and that part of the life is over and now we're on to our new life. Were you afraid of getting caught? That never crossed my mind. I honestly didn't think we were gonna get caught. Oh, but they did. Captured time and again on video cameras, every step documented in receipts and eyewitnesses. This is like a crime I call Hansel and Gretel, where you drop the clues along the way as you go. I mean, they couldn't have laid it out better for the police. Look at them at the Greyhound bus counter. And here, hopping into Janice Budrum's taxi cab. She was in a very dark black hoodie, but she had a very odd looking wig on. It was an old looking share wig, which I found very normal. The girl looked 12, sounded five, and had a 40 year old attitude because she was not afraid to tell me off. I just knew there was something wrong. It might seem like an open and shut case, but next we go inside the little pink house. It was filthy. The thing that shocked me the most was the closet inside Gypsy's house. And what is found behind this locked door might unlock more than a decade of Dee Dee's closely held secrets and hold the key to freeing Gypsy. And I was like, holy y'all need to get it over here right now and look at this. Stay with us. is caught in a web of secrets and lies. Even her age is in dispute. My She's behind bars and charged with murdering her mother, 48-year-old Dee Dee Blanchard, known to the community as a loving caregiver for a sickly gypsy. How did you go from this to this? I always see it as a fall from grace. I thought back then that I was a good person, and now I just see it as it was a fraud, and I made a horrible mistake. A horrible mistake because it turns out that little pink house on Hope and Volunteer Way was actually the nerve center from which the so-called doting mother perpetrated an elaborate scam, preying on the sympathies of countless Good Samaritans. We have unearthed the appearance of a long financial fraud scheme along with this tragic event. Celebrities, charities, even cartoon characters all conned. I was disappointed that I had been duped. That's why I caution anyone not to put money in their accounts until we kind of figure out the extent of their deception. What medical conditions did you believe you suffered from? Um, leukemia, asthma, both vision and hearing impaired, muscular dystrophy, and seizures. Did you always know you could walk if you wanted to? Yes. She told you you had to stay in a wheelchair when you could walk. How did she convince you to do that? I was so young, so me looking up to her so much and just believing that she knows best, I didn't question it. Did you believe you were sick? There are certain illnesses that I knew I didn't have. I knew that I didn't need the feeding tube. I knew that I could eat and I knew that I could walk, but I did believe my mother when she said that I had leukemia. Tell me about Dee Dee. What kind of mom was she? Oh, very protective. Do you think she protected you? No, not in, in certain ways, yes, in other ways, no. Um, I think that she was very sick in her mind. 
For a long time, I believe, like, we were best friends. And when I was younger, she was my best friend. She was your only friend? Yes. Other than my stuffed animals. <laughs> and so I thought that she was a great mother. No complaints. We got along so perfect. You know, I saw her as an angel that can do no wrong. But as Gypsy got older and became curious about life outside the little pink house, she says mom Dee Dee began exerting more control. What happens when she got upset with you? It would go into an argument that would last a couple days, or it could be something where she wouldn't feed me for two days or so. Was she ever physical with you? It started to be physical in 2011. She would hit me with a coat hanger sometimes. Did you ever fight back? No because I was too afraid to. Gypsy says she did try and run away once, but Dee Dee found her a few hours later, and there were consequences. She physically changed she you to the physically bed. physically chained me to the bed and put bells on the doors and told anybody that I probably would have trusted that I was going through a phase and to tell her if I was doing anything behind her back. Did you ever consider in a public place if you stood up out of your wheelchair and walked, Dee Dee's fraud would be completely exposed. I honestly didn't think about that. It never crossed your mind? No. So instead of planning an elaborate escape, you planned a murder? Yes. Public defender Mike Stanfield has the extremely daunting task of coming up with a legal defense for Gypsy. The evidence against her keeps mounting. In my 10 years of practice, this case by far had the most uh, discovery that I've ever had. Close to 100 CDs worth of papers, photos, and digital information. But it's a field trip alongside Gypsy's dad and stepmom he says proves to be the most helpful. While the outside of Gypsy's house is pretty and pink, the inside, a chaos of clutter. Frankly, it was a disaster. There was stuff everywhere. I could tell Dee Dee did a lot of just hoarding and stuff piled up. I mean, like chest high to the back of the room. One of the bedrooms had so many items piled into it that you couldn't even walk into it. But amongst the photos on the wall and the den of disorder, some clues. The thing that shocked me the most was the closet inside Gypsy's house. And I was like, holy <laughs> Y'all need to get it over here right now and look at this. I mean, my mouth dropped. From the top to the bottom, full of so many medications. This isn't your ordinary medicine cabinet. It's Dee Dee's personal pharmacy, a large linen closet fully stocked. She had even written on several of the bottles of Gypsy's medication as if she was writing it for a child. For the anti-seizure medication, it would say, shaky baby. The organization of the medications was shocking to me because in every other area of Dee life it appeared that she had absolutely no organization or cleanliness except when it came to these medications it let me know from the very beginning that something here was seriously wrong you're in a better place now than you were wrong because it turns out not only can gypsy walk she says she's never been sick not cancer not epilepsy not anything the only thing that I have wrong with me is um, I have a little bit of a lazy eye. Not all the time, but um, I have better vision in this eye than I do that eye. That's it. That's it. That's it. Nothing else. Nothing else. When we come back, operations, hospital stays, more than a hundred doctors. Did they fail her? How did they not see through her? Next. They like taking pictures, that's for sure. Rod and Christy Blanchard try to piece together the puzzle of his daughter, Gypsy. This is more. Hunting for clues in photographs and home videos. You're the reason I was born to be your mom. Oh, God, that makes me sick. To sort out fact from fiction. Yo, what's up? Do you think that 
Dee Dee came up with this idea. These movies generated sympathy, which generated news coverage, which generated money and free things. And yeah. See this one right here? I don't know if she meant for anybody to see that. I am about to dive off our porch into the pile of snow. You ready? Everybody could clearly see she's going to be but those old pictures only begin to tell the story. Too many to freaking count. The paper trail is where the really fresh breadcrumbs are in this Hansel and Gretel fairy tale. Hope kids, Jason's dreams for kids, kids wish network. So she would actually look up foundations and stuff that she can hit up and get help with. Fake birth certificate. This one says she's born in 95. Everything else is correct except the year. You can totally it's... tell that she changed the date. Mm -hmm but she didn't change it here. So it was 91, she changed it to 93, and then she turned a three to a five. She just wanted to make Gypsy younger and younger. Right. And that's not all Dee Dee forged, located under her bed. It was that prescription pad that Dee Dee stole from the hospital. But while the paperwork might be fake, the pills and procedures were dreadfully real, including multiple gastrointestinal operations, eye surgeries, even the removal of her salivary glands. Medical records reviewed by ABC News show Gypsy was treated by at least 150 different doctors. Walk me through what that appointment would typically be like. I would have a doll or a stuffed animal that I would play with, and Mom would say, you know, don't talk, just play with your stuffed animal, and we'll do something fun after. The one thing that is absolutely common across every single medical record is that Gypsy never spoke. Every single medical record says, mother reported, mother states, history by mother. Brain scans, muscle scans, blood tests, cat scans, and you were healthy. So how would she get the doctors to understand when none of it was true? She had a very sweet personality, very convincing. She would call it Southern Charm, and she would use her Southern Charm to get them to be friendly and get on their good side. And then she had no records. Because of Hurricane Katrina, it wiped out all the records, supposedly. The biggest question was, though, how was Dee Dee able to calm the doctors? Hospitals we contacted declined to comment, but we tracked down one of her former neurologists, Dr. Bernardo Flasterstein. In my initial assessment, I saw a girl, a 14-year-old girl that was sitting in a wheelchair. Who examined her for muscular dystrophy and cerebral palsy and immediately saw red flags. The testing didn't seem to show the same type of disabilities that Gypsy should be showing. There was nothing there to support either. That kind of made me very suspicious. And his suspicion only grew when he told Dee Dee what should have been exciting news. Gypsy's prior diagnoses were wrong. But the mother was not happy with that. And when she left the office in a storm and told my nurses that I don't know what I'm talking about and that she's not coming back. Dr. Flasterstein ultimately said, I believe that the mother suffers from Munchausen by proxy. That was one of the things that I believe he bolded and underlined in that letter. What is Munchausen by proxy? Munchausen by proxy, it's essentially when a caregiver will fabricate an illness or induce an illness in their child in order to get medical care. Dr. Jamie Kaufman is a board-certified child abuse pediatrician. It's abuse on the child, but it's to obtain attention or some kind of secondary gain for themselves. Sometimes it's financial. It can be. The most common, though, is actually emotional gain. I look at it kind of like an addict who needs that fix. When you have a suspicion and you think that harm has been caused to the child, you could report that to social services and say, I have a suspicion. I, at the time, did not think that I'd had enough information just to call. Dr. Flasterstein didn't call Child Protective Services, but someone else later did. According to this police report obtained by 2020, a doctor alerted authorities when he could not find any symptoms that support what Dee Dee alleges to be wrong with her daughter. Two caseworkers later did visit the Blanchard home, but they found nothing out of the ordinary and closed the case. 
How was Dee Dee able to get away with this for so long? Most of the time, these mothers are pathologic liars. They're very difficult to detect. They're very manipulative. I think she probably did like most of these parents, these mothers. She moved around from doctor to doctor. They go to different hospitals and different institutions. That's exactly what she did. After storming out of Dr. Flasterstein's office, she moved Gypsy's care three hours away to Kansas City. Why did your mom do this? I think that she was constantly seeking attention for herself because she didn't feel loved. So let's make this baby girl sick so it forever needs you. And that's what I think it's from. You know a lot of people see this and just wonder why. Why didn't you say anything? I know, I, I beat myself up about that all the time. But I have to understand my mind frame back then. I was always so afraid of her. Afraid of the consequences after. Next, Gypsy in court, where the consequence could be life behind bars. The knife used in the homicides was found in Nicholas Gordon's phone. And what about that boyfriend? What's he have to say for himself and to Gypsy tonight? His first interview ever when 2020 returns. This is their only selfie together. Gypsy Blanchard dressed as Cinderella, Nick Godijohn, her Prince Charming, but their happily ever after may never come true. The once loving couple now at odds and facing the possibility of life behind bars for the murder of Gypsy's mother, Dee Dee Blanchard. There's a big difference between someone who asks someone to kill someone and someone that actually does it. Is there? I think so, because I would never kill somebody. I would never physically go through with killing somebody. I can't. My uh, co-defendant was putting my name out there in a bad light. That's Nick himself speaking to me via video conference from jail just hours ago. It's the first time he's ever spoken publicly. Describe for me what Gypsy's role was in the murder of Dee Dee. She was basically the mastermind behind it all. I was basically a hired hitman in, in its own weird sense. Do you still love Gypsy? The reason why I did do this is because I was, uh, for one, so deeply in love with Gypsy at the time. I still do love her. How do you feel about Nick now? If you would have asked me that a, two years ago, I would have said I'm still in love with him. But now, I don't hate him. I feel sorry for him. Why do you think he did it? He was very much like my mother in certain ways. Both of them were very controlling. And I feel like I was trained my whole life to do as I was told. We begin with breaking news this morning. Gypsy Blanchard has pleaded guilty to her role in a plot to kill her mother, Claudine Dee Dee Blanchard. In a courtroom stunner, prosecutors cut Gypsy a deal. How did you plead to the Class A felony of murder in the second degree? Guilty. She's to be sentenced to 10 years in the Missouri Department of Corrections. Gypsy's mother was holding her a prisoner. Her mother um, did not allow her to spend any time alone with any other human being. You're actually a prisoner now. How do the two compare? In some ways, they're the same, but now I'm so much more freer. The prison that I was living in before with my mom, it's like I, I couldn't walk, I couldn't eat, I couldn't have friends. Over here, I feel like I'm freer in prison than with my, living with my mom, because now I'm allowed to just live like a normal woman. Prison isn't normal. No, not for most, but for me, it is. What do you think she'd want to say to you? I don't think it would be anything nice. All I can hope is that from wherever she is, that she still loves me in some small way. And I want her to know that I am sorry. I'm so sorry.
So many thorny issues to consider. So what do you think? Between Gypsy and Dee Dee, who was the bigger villain? Let us know on Facebook and Twitter. We do know that Gypsy could be released from prison as early as 2024, pending good behavior. Nick Godijan has pleaded not guilty. He's scheduled to go to trial in the fall. And many of the charities and celebrities who donated money and services to Gypsy and Dee Dee say they were duped. And that's our program for tonight. I'm Elizabeth Vargas. And I'm David Muir. From all of us here at 2020 and ABC News, thanks for watching. Have a good evening. Good night. It was a Friday night in a small American town in Waukesha, Wisconsin. And it was a scene playing out like so many across the country. A small group of parents had said yes to a sleepover, a birthday party. Three 12-year-old girls were dropped off here at Skateland to begin the night. But what would happen over the next 24 hours would haunt three families to this very day. One of those 12-year-old girls, Peyton Leitner, was stabbed 19 times and left for dead in the woods. And the entire scene was planned out by the other two girls. What were you trying to do with her when you stabbed her? Kill her. My mind as well just say it. We were trying to kill her. Because it turns out there was someone else looming large at that birthday get-together. A fictional character named Slenderman, who they learned of on the internet. And those two 12-year-old girls said they were doing this for him. When Morgan said to you that if we don't do this for Slender, um, our families are going to be killed, do you honestly believe that? Oh, yeah, because he could be anywhere from six feet to 14 feet tall. He just constantly wears a suit. He doesn't have a face. His skin is just white. He can explain these tendrils from his back. For more than three years now, 2020 has been documenting the three families nearly destroyed by the horror that played out during that sleepover. And tonight, right here, what we never knew before. Asking the questions, how does this happen? How do 12-year-old girls fall for a fictional character? What would drive them to try to kill one of their own friends? And what should happen to those two girls now? Good morning. Just 24 hours ago, a judge making the final decision. Okay, thank you. Please be seated. After what you're about to see, play out right here tonight. Breaking news, a 12-year-old girl is stabbed. The girl was lured to the area by two of her classmates, who allegedly stabbed her 19 times. The girls had hoped the attack would earn them a home in Slender Man's mansion. Slender Man is a fictional horror character. We have been there for the journey. Two different mothers now visiting their daughters, locked up since they were 12. We try to visit at least once a week. On a good week, I can get out there two or three times. Anissa was actually sent to the Washington County Juvenile Detention Facility. Christy Weyer, her daughter, is Anissa. Most children are only up there for an average of four months, and she's been there almost three years. Angie Geyser's daughter, Morgan, who came up with the plan and who held the knife. The children have no access to the outdoors or even windows to look out of. In the last 35 months, Anissa's maybe had 40 hours of fresh air. And there is no physical contact. I can't wipe away a tear. I can't give her a hug. I can't kiss her. Their daughters are now teenagers. Anissa is 16, Morgan is 15. They have spent countless hours driving to visit their daughters locked up, trying to wrap their heads around how their two little girls, just 12 years old at the time, could have done something so unimaginable. And all of it began that Friday night. What was the plan for that night? On Friday nights, Skateland had um, free pizza. So the girls went a little early and ate dinner and skated. And the third girl who was with them, Peyton Leitner, also just 12. Stacy and Joe Leitner remember their daughter had been looking forward to it for weeks. You remember how excited she was that Friday. Oh my gosh, she was so, so excited. Do you think Peyton had any idea? No, she had absolutely no idea. She was blindsided blindsided by what those two friends had in store and they'd been planning it for months 
After that night of skating, they would return to Morgan's house. Morgan's mother, Angie, downstairs. They played up in Morgan's bedroom with Morgan's dolls. I mean, it was just a normal night. And no sign that two were plotting against a... No, no sign whatsoever. The next morning, Morgan asked if they could go to the park. How often would they go to the park? Well, we were actually, believe it or not, pretty strict parents and didn't let Morgan um, go out on her own very often. But you thought because she had her two friends, it would be safe? Mm -hmm. The first sign anything is wrong, a police officer showing up at Angie's door. And my heart dropped down into my stomach. Not only were there police in my living room, but they were um, wearing riot gear. Across town, officers are also arriving at Peyton's house. Around the side of the house, up over the deck, came a uniformed officer. The first thing that goes through my mind is, something has happened to somebody that I love. And they asked me, where's Morgan? I said, she's at the park with her friends. Angie Geyser says the police tell her that Morgan is missing. They think she may be hiding her daughter. They searched the house, and I just kept asking, you know, what happened? What's going on? And they, they wouldn't tell me other than to say there had been an incident at the park, and one of the girls was hurt. At first, police refusing to reveal which one of those girls was hurt. They quickly also tracked down the parents of the third friend, Anissa Wire, telling them their daughter is missing too. My thought was child abduction. Where's my daughter? That's the only thought I had in my head. It would take hours to piece together exactly what happened at that birthday sleepover. The first moment anyone would begin to learn of the horror is this call to 911. 911, we'll be transferred over a caller on Big Bend. 12-year-old Peyton Leitner had just crawled out of the woods, covered in blood, stabbed 19 times. And you can hear it in their voices. The operators cannot believe what they are hearing. He came upon a 12-year-old female. She appears to be stabbed. She appears to be what? Stabbed. Stabbed? Greg Steinberg was riding his bike that morning on a path that had actually been chained off. It was pure chance he came this way. And you were biking by and she says to you what? Could you help me please? I've been stabbed multiple times. I quick got out my cell phone. I was shaken. He watches as the ambulance rushes her away. And when you looked at her, it was immediately apparent she'd been stabbed multiple times. Yeah, to her chest and abdomen and arm and leg. Doctors fear she might not survive. And her mother, Stacy, has just been told that Peyton has been rushed to the hospital. She was terrified. She was crying. She couldn't breathe. But she saw you there. She saw me and she put her hand out and I rushed over to her. And I put my arms around her and I laid next to her and I hugged her and I said, you're going to be okay. It's going to be fine. But I could see that she was covered. Her arms and her legs and her abdomen, they were covered in stab wounds. There were so many stab wounds, it took two nurses to count them. 19 in all. And her little girl is now being raced down the hall. Did you say anything to Peyton as they were wheeling her away? That I loved her and that she would be okay. Peyton's mother could not believe that her daughter's friend could be capable of this. Morgan didn't do this, is what's going through my head. There's no way. There's no way that's that's what happened. Morgan is 12. Morgan has never heard a fly. <laughs> it was just unthinkable that Morgan would, would do anything to hurt someone else. But that's exactly what investigators were telling Morgan's mother, that her daughter and Anissa Wire had stabbed their friend multiple times, and now both girls were nowhere to be found. They had run away, and the police hadn't found them yet. They're going to find a mansion in the woods. Oh, the mansion, yeah, the mansion in the woods. They were going to the Nicolay Forest because they believed that there was a mansion there that Slenderman lived in. When we come back, the doctors discover it is worse than anyone thought, and we're with the surgeon who saves Peyton. Less than a millimeter between living and dying. Yes and where investigators would discover those girls. They would reveal in their own words why they did this, the stunning interrogations. That's not my daughter saying those things. It was like looking at a different child. Yes. But it was her daughter. 
and what they would discover that had been hidden from that mother for years when we come back. It is Saturday morning in Waukesha, Wisconsin, just outside Milwaukee, and a horrific scene is playing out. A birthday sleepover with three 12-year-olds the night before, and now two of those girls are missing. The third, Peyton Leitner, has somehow crawled out of the woods, covered in stab wounds. 19 of them. Major search by ground. These are the woods where the stabbing police are still on the scene here. Tonight. Morgan Geyser and Anissa Wire were missing, and Anissa's mother was recruiting anyone she could to join the search. We had people all over Waukesha looking for her. Christy had her daughter's cell phone. She scours it, searching for any clues. Instead, discovering something else. Checked all of her text messages, trying to figure out the people that she called and contacted last. And I found basically her goodbye notes. On that cell phone, this note, drafted by Anissa. She writes, this is my final wish to those who care. Do not grieve my absence, but remember me for who I was. I love and cherish you all and wouldn't do you harm. I still had no idea. But as soon as I found that, I called the detective right away and showed him that information. While at that hospital, Surgeon John Kellerman tells us he will never forget the wounds. He tells me about one of the stab wounds to Peyton's heart. The knife cut through the tissue, but not the artery itself. Exactly. And had it not? Had it not, she would have uh, had a major heart attack from the amount of bleeding and probably died within a minute or two. But they would save her life as the hunt for the two other girls intensified. Nearly five hours after Peyton crawled out of the woods, her two friends are suddenly found on the side of Interstate 94, walking out of Waukesha. They have found those two girls, I'm told, around 12 years old. A knife with a five-inch blade was found in one of the girls' bags. Lieutenant Tom Mormon confronting them. I asked her to show me her hands. I noticed there was some staining on her sweatshirt. Morgan's parents raced to the police station, but they have not been told the severity of Peyton's injuries. I remember talking on the way um, how, we're, how we were going to punish Morgan for this. I mean, we just had no idea how, how serious it was. Anissa Wire's parents arrive at the police station, too. They are told to wait. I stood right dead center of that lobby in full view of two cameras waiting to see my daughter. And listen to what their daughter, Anissa, says to the investigator. Um, your parents know that you're here talking to me, okay? And um, if you just there, she's getting there, they're so glad that you're safe. We were scared for you guys. Both girls in separate yeah. rooms, beginning yeah. to explain their plot to kill, referring to Peyton by her nickname, Bella. Why do you think you're here today? Because I'm Anissa, and I ran off after hurting Bella. Morgan tells the detective the plan to kill Peyton had been in the works for months. She hasn't planned this a while. Since December, she was my best friend since fourth grade. Who was? Peyton. So why did you pick Peyton? I didn't pick her. Who picked her? Whoever Anita was talking about. She made it seem necessary. Necessary. A word Morgan Geyser would use again and again with that detective, saying her devotion to that fictional character, Slenderman, drove her to do this. There's this website called um, The Creepy Master Wiki. Mm -hmm. It's full of like, horror stories. And there's one of them called Slenderman. And there's this one called Slenderman. is the story of a character who suddenly appears. He changes and evolves all the time, with help from fans all over the world adding to the story, giving a fictional character New life every day. You have said that Slenderman is the boogeyman of this digital generation. He is uh, the thing that we fear that we don't actually encounter, right? So we check under our beds for the Slenderman, but he's, you know, not actually there. Morgan and Anissa not only believed in Slenderman, they wanted to prove to the world he was real. Morgan said, hey, Anissa, we should be proxies. I was like, okay, how would we do that? indicated that in order to become a proxy of Slenderman, you 
needed to kill somebody to prove yourself worthy to him. As Slenderman's grip on these girls begins to reveal itself, back at the hospital, Peyton Leitner is unable to talk. At first, writing to communicate. One of her first questions is this. Did they get them? We told her they were they were found and the police have them. As a dad in that moment, how hard was that? Harder than I would have ever been able to imagine. This is my little girl who's laying there. And the only thing that I could tell her at the time to make her feel better was that the police have them and she was safe with us. When we come back, the girls now describe their original plan, why it changed, and who actually held the knife in the woods. She did hear the knife. I give it back to her and say, you do the ballistic, go crazy. And for every family watching tonight, we also learn what these parents never noticed. Well, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. When we come back. Two mothers now trying to reconcile the little girls they raised with the 12 year olds who brutally attacked their friend. Morgan was a very happy child. She was intensely creative. She was always um, making up songs and stories. Vanessa did enjoy she did enjoy singing. Bring back. Bring back. Oh, bring back my body to me. And only now do moments along the way seem to carry greater weight. Morgan's mother telling me she remembers showing her daughter a movie, a children's classic. You were watching Bambi, and you noticed something. What was it? We had been concerned to show Morgan the movie. We were afraid when Bambi's mother died, she would be devastated, that she'd be very upset. She, in fact, had quite the opposite reaction. Um, and after Bambi's mother was shot, Morgan just said, run, Bambi, run. Um, it had no reaction whatsoever to her, the mother dying. She wasn't at all concerned about the mom. No, <laughs> no, not at all. And Anissa's mom points to her daughter's childhood and her struggle to fit in. Looking back, Anissa was never really invited to a lot of like birthday parties or anything. I don't think she really made friends that easy. Which is why both mothers say they were happy when their two daughters met at the bus stop in middle school. Morgan did endure a lot of bullying. Um, especially um, in the sixth grade by the other students. They knew what each other had gone through and they were going to be there for each other. What was Anissa like? Anissa was um, always extremely polite. You were witnessing what you thought was a very normal friendship. That's true, yes. It was a new friend for her daughter Morgan, who had already been friends with Peyton since the fourth grade, and their friendship seemed normal too. They were just typical giggly girls. Peyton's parents told us the same thing. Were there ever any red flags? They would have little arguments, but every 12 year old girl has little arguments. Peyton's parents had never met Anissa Wire, but they say that Peyton spoke of her at school and they could never have imagined that their daughter's friends were plotting against her. And it turns out the horror that played out in those woods was not the original plan for Peyton. She would bleed out, they would cover her up with covers to make it look like she was sleeping, and the two girls would run. But when they got home from Skateland, the plan would change. I didn't think it would work. I didn't think any of this would work from the start. I wanted to give her at least one in the morning. The next morning, a new plan. We're going to do it today at the park. That's what Morgan said. As they leave for the park, Anissa tells police that Morgan lifts up her white jacket 
the knife tucked in her waistband. What were you thinking? I'm thinking, dear God, this is really happening. Morgan and Anissa lead Peyton into a bathroom at the park. But one more time, they would change the plan. The girls leave that bathroom and walk down a nearby road. I played out the boys too worried and said we should do it there. So I told them we were going to play hide and seek. At the edge of those woods, Peyton's parents tell me that Peyton remembers her two friends luring her in. They got to the park and they told her they wanted to play hide and seek in the woods. And she told me she didn't want to go. She sensed it. Yeah, she did say she was forced to go. She was going to hide from a place I was going to hide in that room and Morgan and I were going to be like lying on the street chasing down the road. I was going to attack on her and then Morgan was going to just have it. Anissa tells police she sits on Peyton. Peyton says to her, I can't breathe. So she did you like is stabbed 19 times, stumbling, trying to get up. And listen to how Anissa describes that moment. The whole time, Peyton was screaming through pain. They would leave her right there. Has Peyton talked at all about the horror of that moment? We asked her what she remembered about what happened, and she said she remembered everything. Joe, what happened the night after Peyton got stabbed? Morgan said, it was weird that I didn't feel remorse. Yeah. This was a girl who had been in your home many, many times. That was hard because I thought that she really cared about Peyton as a person and they were good friends. Do you know what happened to Bella? Is she dead? I don't know. Do you want to stay in the hospital? That's not my daughter saying those things. It was like looking at a different child. Yes. She appears to have no remorse. She doesn't appear to be frightened. After hours of waiting, detectives finally reveal to Angie what her daughter has done in the woods. Could you believe what you were hearing? No, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. No. No, I, I never, um, I never would have imagined that my daughter was capable of hurting another person. I mean, not only was this hurting, it was multiple stabbings with the intent to kill yes when we come back what these parents would learn about their own daughters an extraordinarily rare diagnosis and for parents watching across this country tonight what are you to do when children are drawn in by someone or something that you never knew existed anisa never talked about slender man to me when we come back For more than three years now, those two girls who confessed to brutally stabbing their 12-year-old friend have been locked up. Their mothers still hope their daughters will one day come home. Christy Wire's daughter, Anissa, sits behind these walls at the Washington County Juvenile Jail. And Christy shows us one of Anissa's paintings done just a few months before that horror in the woods. She's drawing flowers and sunshine and hearts. She tells us she had no idea her daughter had fallen so completely under Slender Man's spell. They did it to impress Slender. Who is the shadowy figure? I was really scared, knowing that Slender could eat away to my whole family in three seconds. Bill and I, although we were divorced, we were still very active parents. I did search her iPad. I did watch over her shoulder. Anissa never talked about Slender Man to me. And Morgan was convinced Slender Man was real too. Who's this uh, creepy guy that you're talking about? Slender Man. Did you know anything about Morgan's fascination with Slender Man? We did, um, and she would, she would show us some of the pictures, and she would um, read us some of the stories. Did you ever think that you know this is a little too dark for my daughter? When I was Morgan's age, I was reading Stephen King novels, so I I just thought it was normal for a, a child of middle school age to be interested in scary stories. 
And it turns out that Peyton, who crawled out of those woods alive, had even told her mom that Morgan thought that Slender Man was real. Did it give you pause? A little bit, but at the same time, these girls are 12 years old, and fantasy when you're 12 years old is still a very active part of your life. But their fantasy would give way to reality, and Morgan and Anissa now face charges of attempted first-degree intentional homicide. When a child 10 or older commits a crime like this, uh, Wisconsin law requires them to be charged in adult court. Anthony Cotton is Morgan's attorney. He says he knew the moment he met her that he was not dealing with a typical 12-year-old. Was it clear to you she was struggling with mental illness? Yeah, it was apparent um, right out of the gate. She'd be looking around the room, she'd be looking in the corner, she'd be seemed to be responding to things that weren't in the room. The girls are formally charged as adults, each facing the possibility of up to 65 years in prison. Seeing her in the courtroom in the jumpsuit with the shackles really hit hard. Morgan and Anissa's families launch a legal fight to get their daughter's cases moved from adult court to juvenile court. Children's court is the right place for this case. It would mean more resources to help treat their mental health, but it also meant that each girl could be freed as soon as their 18th birthday, something prosecutors would immediately fight. In spite of the fact that they were 12, these were two girls that made an extreme serious effort to try to kill Peyton. After the brutal attack, investigators searching Morgan's room would find disturbing evidence of a deteriorating young mind. Dismembered Barbies, drawings of Slender Man with children, and pages and pages of messages that she had written to herself. We pour through those drawings with Morgan's mother and find one of the darkest messages. How typical is it for a 12-year-old to write, I want to die? I don't think it's very typical at all. Morgan also writes, help me escape my mind. This one makes me sad. Why? Just knowing how long she was sick and, and suffering inside her own head before we had any idea. While prosecutors build their case, two mothers visit their daughters behind bars weekly, sometimes daily. It's just her and I, divided by glass, talking. There are moments where my heart is so full of sadness. That's when I put on a mask. I don't allow myself to break down in front of her and see how much this is, this is hurting me. And Morgan's mother tells me about the barrier between her and her daughter. And you would see her through the, the glass? Yes. I mean, it, it was painful. We went months without being able to touch her. Both families now say their daughters are trapped between adult and juvenile courts. And on this day, we are at Anissa's home when she calls to wish her sister a happy birthday. Her father Bill wearing a Superman t-shirt. Anissa still reveres her father to this day. Hello? Hello. How you doing? And then a song for her sister. But as they sit behind bars, they are cut off from the resources typically available to treat children who commit crimes at such a young age. There's social workers, um, there's treatment professionals, as opposed to the adult system, which is um, designed to be punitive. And while they are not treated for mental illness, they are given a court-ordered mental health evaluation. And Morgan, who held the knife, who drew those pictures discovered in her bedroom, and who was unmoved by the movie Bambi all those years ago, she would now receive an extraordinarily rare diagnosis for someone so young. Early onset schizophrenia. Are you surprised? <sighs> no. Um, I wasn't surprised simply because there is a family history of schizophrenia. Um, her father? Yes, her father has schizophrenia. In fact, Morgan's father had been hospitalized at least four times as a teenager himself. Was that one of the first things you thought of after the stabbings? It was, that she must be sick. But if Morgan's father had a history of schizophrenia, we asked, did her parents look for warning signs along the way? I think it was something that had been building that we both didn't notice and also attributed to 
the changes she was going through as an adolescent. Do you feel responsible? I think um, on some level, I'll, I'll always feel responsible for not knowing that my daughter wasn't well. Her daughter, Morgan, would stay in that jail for a year and a half, untreated for mental illness, until a judge gets her moved to a mental health institution where she receives medication. And did you see a change? When she started medication? Oh, yes, we saw a dramatic change. All right. And after more than a year of hearings and evaluations, Judge Michael Boren makes his decision on whether the children should remain charged as adults. It was premeditated attempt to kill someone. On that basis, then, I'll order that the defendant's uh, disguise in this would be retained in the adult jurisdiction. They were just children. They weren't chronic offenders. When we come back, the families battle to save their daughters, to get them help, and to get them a chance to one day come home. But will they be sent away for years after what they did in the woods? Their fates revealed when we come back. It has been more than three years now since that horror in the woods in Waukesha, Wisconsin. And now a community torn. As brutal as the attack was, what do you do with two girls who were just 12 years old when they did it? Morgan Geyser and Anissa Wire are now preparing to be tried as adults facing the possibility of decades in prison. I mean, to me, it's unthinkable to try uh, a 12-year-old child as an adult, regardless of what they've done. You know, there are some who will say she planned it, and look what she did. I don't think that any of that changes the fact that she was a child. We do everything else possible in our society to protect our children from themselves. <sighs> For some reason, we view that differently within the criminal justice system, and that just doesn't make sense to me. Both girls plead not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. The girls will be tried separately. Anissa's case is first, and just days before her trial, she strikes a deal with prosecutors, pleading guilty to a lesser charge of attempted second-degree intentional homicide. Anissa took the plea deal. It was her decision to plead guilty to save Peyton from reliving that day. But as part of that deal, Anissa will now stand trial, so a jury can determine if she should be sent to prison or to a state mental institution instead. The evidence will show. Now 15 years old, walking into court, All right. Anissa's attorney, Joe Smith, acknowledges that she attacked her friend, but argues she is not criminally responsible because she was under the spell of a delusion. The prosecution paints a starkly different picture of a calculating 12-year-old. She knew what she was doing was wrong. The defense calls family members, friends, teachers to the stand to testify that they never knew Anissa was struggling with mental illness. I do. Starting with her father, Bill. Was there any time where she expressed that she had seen things? There was an episode when Anissa was about 10. Um, she had gone to bed for the night. She saw something in her closet looking at her. So, you know... 10-year-old monster in a closet. We turn the lights on and we open the closet. Nothing's in there. I didn't give it any more credit than that. But it would turn out the centerpiece of Anissa's defense would be testimony from three mental health experts. Had you ever seen a case like this before? No. It's almost unfathomable that this could happen. Dr. Melissa Westendorf was one of the court-appointed forensic psychologists who evaluated Anissa. What they had in common was the delusion about Slender Man. Neither family knew that their daughters were mentally ill. Is that difficult for you to believe? No. That it would go unnoticed? It can go unnoticed. Uh, you know, especially with delusions. Delusions can remain uh, compartmentalized uh, for people. And it was Morgan's mother, Angie, who told us she believes her daughter actively hid her delusions from those around her. I think that as she got older and she realized that, hey, maybe this isn't normal, that she did make a conscious effort to hide it. A lot of her hallucinations were friends to her, and I don't think that she wanted to lose those friends. 
And Dr. Westendorf says there also may have been something uniquely compelling to these already vulnerable minds of Morgan and Anissa about the way Slenderman is presented online. Once you find this character on the internet, you can read all these stories that look real. And the doctor says with Anissa, there was something different at play. Remember, it was Morgan who was diagnosed with schizophrenia. Dr. Westendorf then diagnosed Anissa with what's called a shared psychotic disorder, saying that Morgan's schizophrenia, when paired with both of their delusions about Slenderman, would create a perfect storm, luring Anissa into. A lot of parents will say that my 12 year old knows the difference between right and wrong. They would know that it's wrong to stab your friend 19 times in the woods. How did they not know this? They appreciated that what they d were doing was wrong. So if they knew it was wrong, why do it? Because their belief in Slender Man was so powerful and was so strong, they believed that if they did not fulfill their plan, Slender Man was going to come back and kill their families. Dr. Westendorf testified that because Anissa's mental disorder led to her actions that day in the woods, that she should not be held criminally responsible. Prosecutors disagreed. All the psychiatrists were saying the same thing, which is they had this shared delusion, and that compulsion was, if we don't kill Peyton, then Slender Man's gonna either kill us or our families. And what we argued repeatedly was, Anissa, by her own words, said she didn't even know that Slender Man was a threat till after the act was over. I really think about this was I was in danger until after. The case goes to the jury. The seven men and five women deliberate for 11 hours. As they file in, we see Anissa visibly shaking. Anissa Wire was found not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. With that, I will order that she be committed to the Department of Health Services. Their decision was humane. But her daughter's sentencing was yet to come. And given the jury's decision in Anissa's trial, prosecutors now allow Morgan to plead guilty to her family awaits sentencing as well. She's sick and she belongs in a mental health facility as opposed to a prison. At her plea hearing, Morgan is required to tell the judge what she did. What did you do on May 31, 2014? I hurt Bella. All right, so what did you do? I came up from behind her. I jumped on her. And then what happened? And then I stabbed her. When we come back, a judge's decision. How long will Morgan and Anissa be sent away for? Or will they be allowed to go home? And that remarkable little girl who crawled out of the woods determined to live, how is she doing now? More than three years after we first met her. It was just 24 hours ago, the final sentence in a case that began with a sleepover more than three years ago. Morgan Geyser is about to learn her fate. It was just weeks ago that Anissa's sentencing came first. The case is here today. The judge ordering her to a state mental facility for up to 25 years. Anissa will now be under state supervision until she is 37 years old. My fear is she will not really know how to interact with normal people at Walmart, at the gas station, at Pick and Save. After spending 25 years in a mental institution. And before Morgan's mother would learn her own daughter's fate, she shares with me a letter that her daughter has now written to Peyton. Dear Bella, I wish I had words that could make everything better, but I don't. So all I can say is how sorry I am. I can promise you not a day will go by that I don't regret what I did. Stay strong. Morgan. Just yesterday, a judge decided that Morgan will also be sent to a state mental health facility for up to 40 years. It was more than three years ago we first met Peyton, shy in front of the cameras. We did see a glimpse of her smile returning as she shared with us her love of kittens and of family. She's doing well in school. She has friends. She's social. And overnight, Peyton's mother sending us a message for any family dealing with the kind of pain and horror they have faced. 
If you trust in your strength and believe in your resiliency, you will get through this. And tonight, the new images of Peyton. And in just over a week, she will celebrate a milestone, her 16th birthday. A milestone Morgan Geyser will soon reach as well. It's not where you pictured her turning 16. No, you know, I see on social media my friends and family who have children Morgan's age and they'll post pictures of um, them driving a car, um, you know, going to homecoming. Um, you know, it's... That's difficult. And now, after learning Morgan's fate, her mother says life for all three families has changed forever. We're leaving Waukesha. Why? For a new start. I frequently drive by these places that hold horrible memories, and I just want to get us all away from that. Away from those woods that have since been cleared to make way for a new residential development. The scene of that horror now erased. But for those three families tonight, they will never be able to erase the pain.